Phillips, uh, Becky got her PhD from a uh, school probably none of you have ever heard of, Harvard University. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she's here at Berkeley uh, as a Miller Fellow, and uh, then from next January she's going to be a uh, faculty member in the, uh, is it the physics department, the astronomy department? Astronomy. Astronomy department at Penn State. Um, and she's an expert on exoplanets, planets around other stars, and uh, that's what she's here to tell us about today. So thanks, Becky. Here's the Earth. Can you see it? Here it is. It's just tiny dots. 
So, even though we think our Earth is maybe the most important planet in the solar system because we live here, I think the giant planets would disagree with that. For example, here, if we put to scale Jupiter, it's a lot more significant to the planet, and it's really dominating the solar system along with Saturn. So, that's one reason that I really care about giant planets, even though they're so different from the Earth. So, I'm going to start by giving us a little bit of a view of our own Jupiter, just to further tell you how interesting these giant planets are. Here's our own Jupiter. Uh, oh, yes, here it is. It's going to dramatically appear. Here it is, dramatically appearing, our own Jupiter. And you can see there's a lot of really cool features about Jupiter. Um, you can see that it has stripes on it. Those are clouds that have been stretched out by Jupiter's rotation. The clouds are made of sulfur, which would smell like rotten eggs, and ammonia, which would smell like window cleaner. So, this would not be the nicest place to live, but it certainly looks beautiful um, when you look at it through the telescope this way. Another really cool feature that you might know about on Jupiter is that it has this red spot down at the bottom. And that's actually a storm that's several times the size of the whole Earth, and it's been raging at least since the time of Galileo. I think that Galileo would have thought that exoplanets are really cool because his studies of Jupiter are part of what made him realize that our Earth is not actually the center of the universe. When he was looking at Jupiter, here's a little uh, picture of the notebook. He sees these little moons that are orbiting around Jupiter. And this is what led him, part of what led him to think that not everything in the universe is orbiting around the sun. Because these moons are orbiting around Jupiter. Sorry, that not everything is orbiting around the Earth. The Earth is not at the center. Another person who looked at Jupiter through the telescope in the 17th century was Cassini, and he was the one to sketch out these really interesting stripes and spots on Jupiter. So I think they both would have been really interested by all the extrasolar planets and giant planets that are being discovered around other stars, partly because it's just another piece of uh, information that tells us that there is so much going on beyond our own Earth. It's really cool to think about. So let's talk about some of those extrasolar planets now. Here is a cool picture of the moon rising over Lick Observatory. <coughs> this is an observatory that's on Mount Hamilton, so you can actually go visit it. This is the University of California's observatory. And this is where some of the first extrasolar planets were discovered back in 1995. The way that these planets were found was actually a little bit indirect. What they saw is that the star was uh, doing some motion as a planet tugged it around the center of mass. So if you were an alien looking at our own sun, the way that you might know that it has a solar system is that it's moving around because the planet's tugging on it. And the more mass of the planet, the more it's going to tug on the star. So people expected that the first planets that would be discovered might be something like our Jupiter, because it's the most massive planet in the solar system. And actually, to discover Jupiter, you would have had to wait many years as, the, as Jupiter completed its whole year and hugged that star around. So the first exoplanets were a huge surprise because it turned out that you didn't need to wait years and years. You could detect a planet right away because of its special properties. So now here's an artificial mission where we're zooming in on another star, and you can see completely bizarrely parked right next to the star is a Jupiter. This is not an actual picture, it's just an artist's rendition. But what this is meant to show is that there is this giant planet orbiting extremely close to the star, even closer than <coughs> to our sun. And that it was a really something that no one could have predicted. So here's another artist's rendition of a Jupiter being scorched as it's parked next to a star. And so I showed you our own Jupiter. It has all these mysterious details, like the clouds and the stripes trying to understand um, why our Jupiter has these details. But for hot Jupiters, just the fact that they exist and that they're so close to the sun is a really big mystery. There are also some really exotic conditions on these hot Jupiters. Here's a hot Jupiter where uh, astronomers found from doing some simulations that it rains on the Jupiter, but instead of raining water, it rains iron because it's so hot. Some of the 
Jupiters are thought to be evaporating, so that they would have a comet-like tail streaming off them. And by working on this, people have realized that these Jupiters can last during the lifetime of the star because they're only losing a little bit of their atmosphere. But that's because they're so big that they can hold on to their atmosphere, even though they're being blasted by heat from the star. And there have actually been some smaller exoplanets discovered where the planet seems to be almost completely disintegrated. Here's the long telephone number like name of that planet. And this is a planet that has almost completely been evaporated away because it's so close to its sun. So if we compare how is a hot Jupiter different from a Jupiter in our solar system, um, there's a couple of differences that have been really challenging to understand. Um, one is that, so here is the scale of a, our own Jupiter's orbit, so it's really far away from the sun. You can see uh, its orbit is really large. And if we were to look to scale at a hot Jupiter, it would actually be, you can't even see its orbit. And here's Mercury for scale. So this is a Jupiter that's parked extremely close to the star. Another big difference is that if this is the size of our own Jupiter, the hot Jupiter is often puffed up to twice that size. And people think that that's because the hot Jupiter is so close to the star that it's getting all this radiation from the star that it can use to puff itself up. So this is something that is bizarrely different from the solar system. If we're expecting to find something like our solar system, we definitely didn't. Instead, we found this Jupiter moved to be even closer to the star than Mercury. Um, this makes us wonder, is the solar system rare? Are other stars, uh, solar systems, just always completely different? And this is something that we'll go back to throughout the talk, but I just wanted to take a moment to answer this question in a couple ways right here. Is our solar system rare? There's sort of two ways to answer the question. Um, one is to think about, are other solar systems all like our solar system? And the answer to that is no. Other solar systems are really different. Um, so this can be illustrated. Here's another graph. So each of the black points on this plot is a planet that's been discovered. And here, the up the plot is how massive it is. The most massive planets are at the top of the plot. Here's how far away it is from the star. And here are Earth and Jupiter in our solar system. So you can see that of the planets that have been discovered, they're not like our solar system. They're more massive and they're closer to their star. And the rest of the solar system would be down here in the region. So it definitely is the case that there are solar systems out there that are completely different from ours. But that doesn't necessarily mean that our solar system is uncommon. Because actually, all the planets that have these properties are the ones that are the most challenging to detect. So something like our Earth is just not within our capabilities to detect right now. So we can say that not every solar system is like our solar system. But we can't yet say that our solar system is a complete oddball. Because when you look at other stars, you're just not quite sensitive yet to something that would look like our solar system. OK, so let's talk some more about these hot Jupiters. So these are the planets that are really massive and yet really close to their star. Here's an, art, an artist rendition of that. And just to recap, you didn't expect to find a planet this big so close to the star. And it's a big mystery how it got there. And this has been the question that I was working on during my PhD thesis. And to try to answer it, I want to go back a couple steps to how do planetary systems form and where do we expect the planets to be? So this little movie will take us, um, actually I think we're going to slowly get started. It will take us zooming into a cloud. <coughs>
forms, there's all this material falling onto it, but because it's spinning material, as it collapses, it makes a disk. So this is why we think our solar system is in a disk, because it forms in a gum disk like that. You can also see in this movie how there's outflows from the star uh, going the opposite direction, which is something that people have observed around young stars. So now we're going to zoom into this disk where the planets are forming, and we expect that giant planets like Jupiter will actually be forming somewhat far away from the star, and that's because we think that this is where there's enough material to make the planets rocky part, and then to grab a bunch of gas from the disk before the disk starts to go away. So in our young solar system, it was full of gas, all the gas was in the disk. Now we're not, our solar system is not full of gas. The gas went away eventually because the star is blowing it out of the solar system. But the giant planets need to form when the gas is still there. So they need to be far away from the star like our own Jupiter. So the expectation is that uh, a lot of these extrasolar hot Jupiters actually formed in a location somewhat near where our own Jupiter would be. But then they somehow got their orbit shrunk so that it's so tiny nowadays. It needs to shrink from this huge orbit to this tiny orbit. And there's a couple different ideas for doing that. <coughs> One is that during the planet formation process, remember that the planet is in this disk full of gas. And that gas can actually cause the planet to move around in the solar system. So one idea is that the hot Jupiter got moved around by the disk. The other idea is a little more violent, which is that when you have all these young planets in a planetary system forming close together, they can have gravitational interactions among each other and kick each other around in the solar system. So maybe our young solar system was a lot more of a violent place where planets were scattered around, and some of them can get kicked closer to the star and become a hot Jupiter. So as I worked on this during my PhD thesis, I came to the conclusion that probably both of these mechanisms both the disks sort of gently moving the planet around, but in other systems, <coughs> planets kicking each other around, we're probably at work in young solar systems, um, moving around the planets from the location where they form. So, yes? What, what would be the ambient temperature of the gas for a person to favor formation like this? Um, so it turns out that the planets don't really care very much about the, uh, the gas that's in the disk around them. It's just as easy to form out farther away in the disk as close in. Um, so the temperature uh, out where the Jupiters are forming is probably uh, pretty low. I, let's see, it's less than zero degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Um, but that doesn't actually end up being a big effect on the planet's forming because it's just trying to grab all this gas and it doesn't care so much what the temperature is. What it really cares about is whether there's a lot of rocky material there to make the core of the planet and have gravity pull in the gas. So that's actually why we think that planets need to, giant planets need to form really far away from the star. But it's, it's a pretty cold temperature out in the Jupiter where it forms. Yeah, the gas would <coughs> form probably would be so energetic it wouldn't clump, right? Um, so, so this is sort of like how I could, uh, I could say that a Jupiter can't form close to the star because it's really hot and people might say, oh, that makes sense, you believe me. But that turns out not to be a very important effect. The gas is always cold enough that it's not going to be escaping. So it's really more a matter of having more materials in the outer part of the disk, even though it seems a little counterintuitive. Okay, so having these really violent interactions among the planets, among the planets early in the solar system uh, can be interesting for studying the giant planets but it can also have a profound effect on the terrestrial planets in the system. So even if I didn't convince you that these <coughs> planets are really interesting, if you only care about small planets like the Earth, you should still care about how planets are kicking each other around early in the solar system. And I'm going to show you now a simulation of how this can <coughs> proceed and what consequences it might have for the small planets. So here is a planetary system starting out very quiet in a flat disk. Here are the giant planets, they're far away from the star. And then here <coughs> in, you have the materials that would be used to form something like the Earth. And where's the star? The star would be right here. Yeah. So now we're going to turn on gravity and see how things could get shaken up. So the, you can see that the small close-in planets are growing a bit bigger. 
slowly process the planets are coming down, really terrible things like this can happen when a small planet like the Earth might not survive. Yes? What's the y-axis? Uh, so, I'm sort of having you imagine that the y-axis is how far it is from the plane of the solar system. Um, another way to think of it is how elliptical these orbits are going, <coughs> and that's technically what it is in the movie, but you can also think about it planets staying in the plane of the solar system, or are they getting shaken out of the plane of the solar system and being kicked away? Yes? Is this movie produced by a computer model, or is this something that was uh, simulated by, by hand? Yes, it was, computed, uh, it was computed by a computer model. So, since we can't watch uh, solar systems evolve for the of years, what we usually do to study them is uh, have a bunch of planets in a simulation where we're including all the gravitational forces between them, then we can see what happens to them over time. Okay? So, yes? So since there was that one point where everything sort of flew apart, can you sort of zoom in on that one point and see kind of what caused it? Is there any intuitive way of describing what caused it? Um, yeah, what's causing it is that uh, in order for things to be staying in a nice flat plane, that's what's going to happen if each planet is only feeling the gravitational forces from the sun. But if things are so close together, like they might be in the early solar system, the gravitational interactions among the planets become important, then they can change each other's orbits and cause them to cross with each other. And that can result in kicking something out and having planets colliding. So having a, a tightly packed system like that is what leads to this really strange these 
giants, they just think it's a mountain. It's actually a giant who are battling each other, and that's what's causing all these rocks to fall. So if you're in a dense solar system, even if you only care about the small Earth-like planets, the sort of global situation set up by the giant planets in the system can be really important. So now talk a little bit more about some of the consequences of these gravitational interactions among planets. So one really striking thing about the solar system is how flat it is. All the planets are going around in the same plane, and if we were to look at the solar system edge on, we would just see all the planets lined up. They're, they're moving in orbits, but it's all in the same plane. And so we might expect that to be the case in other solar systems, but then again, given that movie, I should be maybe not, because gravitational interactions among planets can kick them out of the plane, we might have other solar systems where the planets aren't orbiting in the same plane. And so this is something <coughs> my colleagues and I have been working on recently, and we've found some evidence that there are particular types of systems containing these close-in giant planets, where there's another planet in the system <coughs> that's in a different plane, and that this is causing some very strange behavior in their orbits. And there's an article about our work saying solar systems with their own rule books. This is just another way of saying that other solar systems can sometimes look profoundly different from the solar system. So another consequence of planets moving around in the early solar system and sort of being out of place from where we expect them is that this sometimes helps us if we want to take a picture of the planetary system. As Steve mentioned, there are very few planetary systems where we can actually take a picture of the planet, because most of them we just detect their effect on the star. But I'm going to show you one of them right now. This is a system called Omohot. All this red stuff is uh, a disk <coughs> of asteroids, kind of like our Kuiper belt. Um, but if we were to look at the scale of the solar system, it would all be within this black region that has been shaded out, because so that's where the star is. So to discover this planetary system, astronomers from Berkeley walk past the line of the star, they saw this disk full of asteroids and other little bodies, and then as they carefully looked, they actually saw the direct light from the planet. It's hard to even see here, but there's two tiny pricks of light that are some sort of, um, they think, giant planet that's out way far away from the star. So this is different because instead of being really close to the star like a hot Jupiter, this is a planet that's tens of times further away from the star than a Jupiter. So somehow these processes in the early solar system can maybe move a planet out a really distant region too. And this has actually been helpful because this is what lets astronomers take, in a few cases, an actual planetary system. Because if this planet were as close in as Jupiter were, then the light from the sun would be obscuring it, and they wouldn't have been able to take this picture. This planet also has a highly elliptical orbit, which may tell us something about how it got out there. This may be a sign that it got kicked out of this location where we see it today. How, how far is this away? Oh, how far away is this planetary system? Um, it's like tens of light years away. It's a relatively close one. Why do the uh, edges of the disk seem to be uh, somewhat scalloped? Um, yeah, this is a good question. So it's because these, um, I said that we're seeing the asteroids. That's not actually, that was a little bit of an approximation. What we're seeing is the dust generated from asteroids colliding with each other. You can't see the asteroids themselves. And dust actually gets pushed around a little bit by light from the star. And so that's what creates this sort of flowing out structure. So I just wanted to bring back this crazy movie to remind you of how crazy things can be in an early solar system. And maybe as you were watching this movie, you thought, thank goodness that didn't happen in our own solar system, because we really would have been in trouble. However, actually something like this we think did happen in our solar system. We think that the giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Earth, Uranus, and Neptune, formed a lot closer together to each other, and that they actually did have a kind of instability like this that moved them around and led to the configuration that we see today. 
But things were quiet enough that Jupiter only moved down a little bit towards the terrestrial planets. And so it didn't completely disrupt them like it did in that simulation. So we sort of got away with just having a little bit of gravitational interactions between the planets in our early solar system. And some people think this was actually a good thing, because as these planets were stirring each other up, just like as you saw in that simulation, how these blue bodies are getting kicked around, those are asteroids that then can be delivered to the Earth, and some people think that's how Earth got its water. So this is a little movie of that. We think in the early solar system, there are asteroids being flung towards the Earth. Those asteroids had water on them, but the Earth actually formed to be dry. And that, that might be how the Earth got at least some of this water. Yes? How long would this period of instability would have lasted of these uh, planets moving around frantically? Yeah, so we think this was during the first 100 million years of our solar system. And now the solar system is about 5 billion years old. But it depends on the planetary system exactly how long the stage lasts. So this makes us wonder if we should think of giant planets as really being sort of bullies of the solar system. And I don't think that's necessarily true. Sometimes they can be bullies, and sometimes they can shake up a system, and something like the Earth can get in real trouble. But sometimes they can be more like a, a protecting older sibling. And this is as someone asked about um, an effect that Jupiter has in our own solar system. So in our own solar system, Jupiter, because it's far out and because it's so massive, can actually protect us from asteroids that are coming in towards the Earth. And so a dramatic example of this was a few years ago when Comet Shoemaker-Levy uh, went on its way into the inner solar system and got intercepted by Jupiter. So this is a movie showing how Fragments from the comet hit Jupiter instead of the Earth, so that's very good. And then I'll show you some pictures that were taken of the fragments hitting Jupiter um, during that really interesting event. So here you can see different hot uh, spots on Jupiter, and you can see uh, certain darkness from comets coming in. So this was a really interesting way to learn about the solar system and a way that Jupiter really can have to ask. Yes? Is it just a lucky coincidence that Jupiter was placed uh, where those did, or, or did Jupiter actually pull those things? Yeah, it actually pulled those things toward it because its gravity is so strong that if something comes through where Jupiter is, there's a pretty good chance that it will capture it into orbit instead of uh, the bodies coming to impact the Earth. Um, yeah, it's true. It depends on the exact configuration. Um, but things are that are coming from the outer solar system may not be moving in that fast, and then they might see Jupiter depending on the exact angles of things involved. So it doesn't protect us from everything, but it can protect us from some things. Yes? On the other hand, don't you think that Jupiter prevented another planet from forming between Mars and Jupiter, and therefore there's that asteroid belt which sometimes uh, sends uh, uh, hazardous materials towards the Earth. Yeah, so that's a good point, that the asteroid belt is a source of near-Earth asteroids, that we maybe would have had another planet form there if Jupiter hadn't been around. So there's a lot of trade-offs involved, actually. And this actually brings up a really good point, that when we're looking for another planet that we think might have life, or that might be like the Earth, a lot of times we just assume that it needs the same ingredients as the Earth does to be a good place to live. Um, but that can be sort of a narrow-minded view, and we actually have to think a little bit more broadly about what we do with planet. Um, one example of this is that people used to think that the Earth needed to have a moon in order to keep its pole stable, instead of flipping around wildly and having these really extreme seasonal variations. Um, but as they started to simulate more planetary systems, you don't actually necessarily need to have a moon in order to stay in a fairly stable configuration. Or sometimes other planets can perturb you even if you don't have a moon. So it's really only in the past couple of years that people started to think that you don't actually need to have a moon to be a good place to live. Isn't yes? There a, isn't there a fairly well-accepted theory that the moon was formed by an 
but the graph showed a diminution instead of a direct drop. Now, does that mean that we're only seeing planets with a very uh, <coughs> slow periodicity so that it crosses the threshold? Yeah, so you're talking about how, yeah. it, it, how doesn't it doesn't go straight down. down. Um, that's because there's at the beginning, you have part of the planet in front of the star. So the planet's moving relatively slowly. It is, yeah, it is. So what of these So there might be a lot of fast planets as well, but this so, so that's true, but uh, the spacecraft is taking measurements so often that we can find even really fast planets, right. even ones that are orbiting the star um, much faster than Mercury. But yes, that's but exactly what slower. you're seeing. You're seeing the planet is going slowly enough that you can see the part where it's only part in front of the star. When it's um, not <laughs> Yes. Oh, so you might also be asking about why the shape isn't perfectly flat at the bottom. And that's because the star itself is not loose, uniformly illuminated. It's brighter in the center and darker at the edges. So out here, the planet's uh, blocking a more dark part of the planet, so it's less of a severe dip than it when it's blocking the brightest part. And the same thing with all these wiggles. This is actually kind of a realistic movie because a star has spots and it has uh, other prominences on it, so depending exactly <coughs> on what part of the star the planet is walking, this dip will be a little bit different. Yes? What is Kepler's sampling rate? How often do the pictures take for the movies? Um, so it has two sampling cadences. One is a 30 minute cadence. So uh, this is most of the stars. It's only taking, um, well, so what it's doing is actually integrating up the other <coughs> light over 30 minutes. So it's like if you had a camera and you took a really long exposure. Then there's some subset of targets where the, they also take one minute exposures at the same time. And so that can be really valuable for being able to see this curve in more detail. But unfortunately, sending all that data back to the Earth to the Deep Space Network was a limit. So they couldn't actually send back uh, enough data to have one minute cadence on everything. So most of it is just every 30 minutes, uh, there's a data point saying how much light is in total was lost during that time. Yes? Um, what would happen, I mean, you wouldn't see the planets if they if, if were rotated by a degree that was orbiting like this, right? You wouldn't yeah. see the transit at all. So is that why, perhaps, or has that been taken into account in that 40%? Yeah, absolutely. That was an, Someone else asked that in a different way, but I, I'm glad that you asked in another way because it's, it's a little bit of a confusing concept that we actually have to make a correction for the planets that were missed because the orientation was right. And what this assumes, which we think is pretty reasonable, is that planets are just randomly oriented in the galaxy. They don't know about each other, so that makes sense. So you know exactly how likely it is to see the planet transit based on how far it is from the star. So if it's the Earth, if we were looking at the sun from some random other star, there would be a 1 in 200 chance that the geometry would be right to get this transit. So then 40 for 100 takes that into account. Yeah, exactly. So, oh yes. Do you have enough information, enough stars to tell if there's a difference between stars with planets and stars without? Um, yes, that's a great question. So. Uh, people are trying to, exactly as you asked, look at if like, different types of stars are more or less likely to have planets. And one of the more interesting results of the Kepler mission has been that the smallest stars are about twice as likely to have a small planet. And we're still understanding why that might be the case. But yeah, it's very interesting to look at different, about the trends with what type of star it is, because not every star is just like the sun. Um, so uh, another statistic that you might care about is how common are giant planets? And here, this isn't from the Kepler mission. This is from uh, some of the ground-based telescopes that I told you about in the beginning. People have found that there are about 10 to 20 giant planets per <coughs> stars. So this is actually one very interesting answer to the question of is our solar system common. In some ways, it isn't, because it has a giant planet and about 80 to 90% of stars don't have a giant planet. So in that way, we actually are a little bit unusual in that we have Jupiter and Saturn in our solar system. So now I'm going to show
actually combine this data set with the data set from the ground to arrive at um, a complete view of the planetary system. Let's see. I don't know where I put the plot. Yes. So like this statistic out here for analogs of Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, and Neptune, those are too far away from the couple missions to have detected. But our telescopes from the ground that detect the motion of the star find the planet that way are more sensitive to these ones. So we're needing to put together data from all these different instruments to get a complete view of the planetary system. Um, this is a little gallery showing some of the Kepler planets that have been discovered. And whenever you see some, uh, some graphs like this from the Kepler mission, it can be a little puzzling how the planets are like pink and green and yellow, sort of look like gumballs. Like I'm always struck by that. And that's sort of the way NASA's way of saying we have no idea what any of these planets are made of. We only know their sizes. And we're particularly interested in these planets that are between the size of Earth and Neptune. Are they rocky like the Earth, or are they sort of a mini gas or ice planet like Neptune? And this ambiguity is reflected in the fact these are all different names for planets between the size of Earth and Neptune. Some people call them super-Earths. Some people call them mini-Neptunes. Some people call them gas dwarves, or ungiant planets, or gas light planets. And the fact that our community has so many different names to, for these type of planets reflects the fact that we're just very unsure about what they're made of. Um, here is an example called gj 14 b which is planet right in the size range that has a very ambiguous uh, composition. So now, what are our prospects for figuring out more about these planets? Yes? Uh, so, Kepler has discovered so many planets <coughs> and so there's other techniques for discovering planets. Can you give us an idea of how many planets were discovered by Kepler versus uh, other techniques? Yes, great question. So, Kepler found at least a thousand planets. Um, the technique I mentioned at the beginning where you detect the motion of the star, that is found, uh, I think, about 500 planets. Um, direct imaging, where you actually can take a picture of the planet, has so far only found a few planets because that's been the most challenging technique. So there are new surveys starting with that that should increase that number. So Kepler has been the big player as far as number of planets. But it is only looking at the closest in planets, so it's really helpful to have all of these techniques coming together. Yes? How do we know that the image of a planet is a uh, close, close in Jupiter and not a smaller planet like Earth further out? And wouldn't the diminution of light be the same? Um, so we're actually so far away from these stars that the separation doesn't affect uh, the size of the light blocked. Like, I think what you probably have in your head is, like, here on the Earth, how big something looks depends on how far away it is. But we're so far away that it's just as if the planet and the star are at the same distance as far as uh, that's the projection effect. So there's not an ambiguity there with the size. Um, so there are new missions coming up. One of them is the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, which will look at all the brightest stars in the sky and try to find uh, planets that are transiting them. Because remember how Kepler just looked at a patch of stars, so they're not all really the bright ones. So then that will be really exciting, because then we'll actually have that situation where we go outside at night and we will look at stars and say, oh, this one has a planet and this one has a planet. Yes? Just to piggyback on what he was asking, the how do you make, are you making the assumption that these other planetary systems are like ours? We're, because we can tell from the amount of light block the size, if you will, of that planet, but we're assuming, you're assuming that that Jupiter is close because of its periodicity as a part of R. You know, yes. It could be moving a whole lot faster and be further away. Oh, yes, I see your question. You... So, so for a circular orbit, um, Kepler's law 
tells an, us an exact relationship between the separation and the period. But if it, the planet is on an elliptical orbit, then its speed actually depends on where the orbit is. So this was actually part of my PhD thesis, to look for planets that were moving too quickly compared to what you'd expect. And that will tell us that they're on very elliptical orbits. Yes? Why won't spe spectroscope, spectroscope technology tell us what they're made of? We can detect what, what missing galaxies have. Yes, so that's exactly what this spacecraft, James Webb Space Telescope, um, it'll be doing a lot of things, but one of the things will be to try to detect molecules in the atmospheres of planets. And this has been done already for the giant planets, but at the moment we don't have a telescope big enough to do it for the small planets. And that's what this space telescope will do. The one subtlety here is that um, the star is so bright that it's completely dominating the light that we see. We don't usually, we're not usually able to see the light separately from the planet. So what we have to do is wait for the planet to pass in front of the star. Then the star light is streaming through the planet's atmosphere. Then we wait for it to move off the star and we see just the star's light. And that's differential technique is what gives you the molecules in the atmosphere. But because it's differential like that, it makes it a very challenging measurement. And that, so that's why we need this new space telescope that's going to be a lot more sensitive in order to look at this for the smaller planets. And that's the one where we're sort of ambiguous about what they're made of. Because the giant planets, it's pretty clear from their mass and their size that they must be made mostly of gas. But with the small planets, it's more ambiguous, and it's more ambiguous whether um, they're icy, whether they have some gassy part. And so that's where we really need these measurements. I'm going to end with my favorite planet, which is Saturn. It used to be Saturn because of its rings, but now it's been replaced by this really cool planet, or really hot planet, called 55K3e. And this planet is so close to its star that its orbital period is less than a day, so it's really whizzing around the star. And it's getting so close that if it does have a rocky surface, the surface is probably melted into a magma ocean. So this is the first planet that I worked on, and it's very dear to my heart, even though it's not going to be a great vacation spot. <laughs> <laughs> and last, I'll just show you that NASA is actually thinking about vacation spots. They made these posters that says, experience the gravity of HD 40307G, a super Earth. So this is a giant Earth where the gravity would be much stronger. This is a poster for a planet that's orbiting two stars of their 16 feet. And here's a planet that's orbiting a very red star. So we'd expect the planets are a lot redder than color than the green planets on Earth. So we're going to have some, hopefully, some great vacation spots in the future. But for now, I'm happy that these extrasolar planets are actually teaching us how our solar system fits into the galaxy and telling us about what type of planets are called. So thank you very much.
Yeah, I would say that if we waited long enough and we had something like Kepler that we'd be able to see the Earth, um, transit, if we were lined up so that it transited, the Kepler mission was developed to be sensitive to a planet like the Earth orbiting a sunlight star. So for a lot of these things, if we watch for a long enough time, we can build up the signal. How long is long enough? Like two years? Um, so, so it depends on the type of signal that we're looking for. If it's a transit signal, then we're the planet passing in front of the star. Usually we need at least three of those to be able to detect the planet securely. So for the Earth, we have to be able to wait three or four years. Uh, yes? Does any of these calculate how many so-called Goldilocks planets are that are about the size of location possibly support the planet's chart? Yes. So there have been some studies particularly focused on these. So planets, as you say, that are about the size of the Earth and are separated from their stars since they have a similar temperature. And so let's see. So the results have been a little bit ambiguous for some of the stars um, because we're really only barely sensitive to something like the Earth. So it turns out to be really sensitive to the type of corrections that you make. But sort of a rough estimate that people are getting is sort of one in five or something like the Earth, around a sunlight star. There are better statistics for uh, smaller stars because it's a lot easier to detect the planets around them. And there, the statistics are more robust and are telling us more like uh, more like two, two and five or three and five for planets that are uh, something that has the same temperature as the Earth. So this is actually something really exciting is that if we're thinking about how common is life and that it, if it does need to have an environment like the Earth, that it's seeming like planets like the Earth are pretty round and mill and that a lot of stars have them. Yes? I know it's just for fun, but is anybody updating the great equation, at least as far as calculating how many planets may have evolved simple life? Um, yes, and I actually even have a t-shirt signed by the great great. <laughs> Thank you. 